Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And here today with me is Tio Dechev, President, CEO, and Director at Mindoro Capital. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to see you. Thank you for inviting me. Really nice to be talking and lots of questions for you today. I thought we could start at the beginning. So exploration, we know, is arguably the most difficult part of the mining business. And this is where you're situated at Mundoro and with a large portfolio of projects. So I thought to begin, if you could outline the business model for people who might not be familiar with what your company's doing. Sure. So we, within the uh, mining space, producers, developers, and explorers, but within explorers, there are also generators, which is what Mandora focuses on. And so the generator model is to go out and um, find locations on the planet where you believe that there is an opportunity to make new discoveries. And different generators perhaps may focus on different commodities. So we focus on copper porphyries, and we believe there's a very strong opportunity for more copper porphyry discoveries in the Eastern Europe, Western Tethian, and as well as in Arizona, which is the Laramide Belt. So our focus is to go out, acquire land packages, um, get those permitted, work with local communities to understand uh, the local you know, drilling process, and then bring in partners in order to spend and explore and make a discovery. Right, and I'm really curious about that part of the process where you shop around your land packages, the things that you've found to these larger companies. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how you do that, how you determine you've done enough work, et cetera? It's a really good question. And sometimes uh, some assets come more advanced. So for example, there may be a historic um, mine there, or there may be some kind of mineral occurrences. So in those situations, um, we will obviously stake the ground. And if there's an existing mine, we will actually build out the data set of what's historically available. So that would be an example of a more advanced project. Others are very conceptual, just understanding the volcanic units that are in that particular region, recognizing that they do tend to be mineralized, and then going out and staking around basically where you know that uh, volcanic unit exists, and then conceptually coming up with where the target would be. Okay, and then I, the flip side of that, I think, would be how do you decide when it's time to throw in the towel, you have something, and maybe it's not quite working? How do you make that decision? Uh, I think once you, if you have a project and you've developed your, your drill targets and you've drill tested, and you can very clearly uh, explain basically the anomaly that you were drill testing and that it's not productive, that would be an opportunity to drop a project. Okay, really interesting. So one of the big themes that I've heard in recent years when it comes to exploration is that we're really not seeing the major miners do as much of it as they used to. They are relying on acquisitions of smaller companies or partnerships with smaller companies to do that for them. I wondered if you could speak about that, if it's something that you see continuing, if it may change in the years to come, what do you think? I think that's a really good question. There is a really great uh, chart by Minix Consulting in Australia, who's done some great research to exactly demonstrate that from the 1950s until now, who's actually out there doing the exploration work. And yes, it was historically the large mining companies were the lion's share, and then it really shrank down. Um, obviously, the the capital markets have created an opportunity where junior companies can actually go out, raise money, and do that exploration work on their own without the seniors. And that's very well utilized in the gold market. But in the base metal market, it still has been predominantly the base metal companies that have been doing most of that exploration. There is a niche, I think, of junior explorers that do focus on base metals. That's a much smaller subset of the industry. Um, but I think particularly when it comes to porphyries, that partnership is actually very powerful because the juniors can go out and very quickly acquire the land position. They have local knowledge. They'll work with local geologists, but you need those deep pockets in order to really explore. And that's where those joint ventures really are quite beneficial to both parties. Okay, really interesting. A couple of points there that I, I hadn't heard of before. And so as you've been saying, Mandora is focused on copper and gold, but I believe leaning more toward copper. So I was hoping we could talk a little bit about market dynamics there. So copper is pretty interesting. I think it's definitely part of the energy transition. On the flip side, though, we have those recession concerns that I think are weighing on some people. So what are you seeing when it comes to, to 
It's such a good question and there's so much discussion around it. <laughs> um, I think there really are two pictures to think about. One is the long term. So electrification is not going to magically subside because we are in a high interest rate environment. Yes, there will be short term pressure on pretty much most commodities that you know industrial production uses, but long term, that is very much a fundamental metal needed in our global economy. So long term, um, the demand is there. And when you think about what it is that the majors are looking for, they're looking for those long life mines. So currently, it's actually a pretty interesting marketplace because 70% of all copper production comes from copper porphyries. And when you look at the copper porphyries, there's probably a dozen mines on the planet that really do the lion's share of that supply. And in that case, when you're trying to replace one of those, it's a decade long process of exploration, if not longer. So personally, from what we've seen as a company and from our partners is that that search for more large scale copper porphyries, it's very much strong and there's a strong pipeline of exploration. Uh, and I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon. Yes, there will be short term pressures on the copper price, which will be opportunities for investors, but long term is not a deterrent. Okay, and that ties into another question I wanted to ask, which is, so we know that copper discoveries have been a little bit few and far between in recent years. And I guess, as you've been talking about, maybe the length of time that it takes is part of the reason. Are there any other factors that are influencing that? Yeah, well, again, if we kind of um, focus in on the copper porphyry, so 70% of global production is from porphyries. Another 20% is probably from sediment host systems, so they're not to be ignored, but they usually do come as peripheral to a lot of these intrusions where the copper porphyries exist. So when you look at that marketplace, the copper porphyries, um, they're actually abundant on the planet. What's really rare though, is the higher grade ones that are on surface that you can open pit mine. So you're looking for kind of a uh, a crossover of uh, you know good jurisdiction, low cost to mine, so you want it to be near surface or you want it to be in a very tight block cave, which has higher grade. Um, and you need a certain level of grade based on what you expect the copper price to be. So it's, I think, a little bit of a simplification for our industry to say that there isn't really any copper on the planet. There's lots of copper, but economic, long-term, sustainable copper is more difficult to find. Right. And do you think that as we move forward, maybe with different technologies, are we going to see more of the ones that aren't economic right now perhaps become so in the future? I think that's the hope. <laughs> Everyone hopes for that. Uh, I mean, certainly we're looking at in situ leaching, right, is, is something that the industry is, um, you know, really trying to see under what circumstances that it will work. For example, there is, you know, the Florence deposit in Arizona, which, uh, you know, is kind of a newly developed and um, uh, kind of in situ uh, production, whereas Gunnison is another uh, in situ uh, operation, which hasn't been successful, again, because the metallurgy is quite complicated. So I think the industry is looking at in situ. I think we're all looking at um, more efficiency in, in metallurgical processes. That will definitely be an important catalyst to make more of those deposits that are sitting on the ground at lower grade perhaps be more economic. Mining methods, you know, we've done a lot of cost saving already as an industry. It's hard to imagine that we're going to be able to squeeze more dollars out of the mining side. So it's got to be metallurgy and the methodology like in situ. So I'm and blocking. Blocking. sorry. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Um, hopefully we can talk now also about some of the work you're doing at Mindoro right now. So you're operating in the U.S. as well as Eastern Europe in the Western Tathian Belt. So I think that people are probably familiar with the U.S. as a jurisdiction, but I was hoping you could share some history information about the Western Tathian because maybe people aren't as familiar with that. Um, the West, so the Western Tethian uh, is a really important uh, belt. It runs from Eastern Europe right through, um, you know, Turkey, the Stands, and into Southeast Asia. So if you can compare it, it's really like the belt from, uh, you know, Alaska through British Columbia down through the U.S. and into South America. 
Um, with Eastern Europe, it's not, I think geologically, everybody knows of the Tethyan belt, but jurisdictionally, people don't really understand what it's like to operate there. And Eastern Europe, from our perspective, I mean, Bulgaria is part of the European Union and Serbia is a candidate to be in the European Union. We've been operating there for 10 years and we have found it quite straightforward and generally simple to operate. It is, uh, every jurisdiction is slightly different, so you just need to know their local rules and laws in terms of permitting. Okay, that is exactly what I was hoping to, to get at, so that's great. I also wanted to, of course, touch on catalysts for the company in 2023. We've got half of the year remaining. What do you have coming up? We have a lot of drilling. <laughs> I can imagine. We, we have uh, about 17,000 meters of drilling this year. So of that, um, we have about 2,000 meters left to do in, in Arizona. We have about 2,000 meters in Bulgaria in a sediment hosted system that we're uh, in partnership with JOCMEC, which is a branch of the Japanese government. And in Arizona, we're with Valet. Uh, and then in Serbia, we have about another 3,000 meters with Valet. Uh, we just finished 2,000 meters with uh, BHP, and we have about another 3,000 meters with Kinross in Serbia. So lots of drilling. Uh, a lot of work has gone into preparing it in the first half of the year, and really interesting targets that um, we want to get through drill test and then be able to talk to the market about. Okay, really interesting. And I wanted to also take a step back, if we can look at the exploration industry a little bit more broadly, and talk about trends that you're seeing or challenges that you think the industry is facing at the moment. Such a wide question. <laughs> is there any anywhere specifically where you... Um... Well, I think a lot of the time when I ask about challenges for exploration, it's, it's financing or mm -hmm. things like that. I wondered if you had maybe a different perspective because course you have partners who are helping you out with that so what are you seeing I, I don't think the cyclical nature of the market is a challenge for the industry because that affects all industries um, and I think good projects and good teams always find capital so I don't necessarily see that as a constraint but what I do see is that um, first of all there's a lot of companies and so I think it's hard for the investment community to try and filter through what it is that they're interested in investing in so I think that's a challenge broadly for investors in the sector, but as an industry, you know, um, costs are definitely going up. Uh, it's quite expensive. It gets, you know, more and more expensive to drill every year. I think geophysical techniques are underutilized or not necessarily always effectively utilized. So we can be perhaps more cost efficient in terms of, uh, or just exploration efficient in terms of how we go about uh, finding our targets. Uh, obviously, labor is a massive constraint. There are not enough uh, experienced geologists, uh, you know, globally to do the amount of exploration that uh, I think we have going on in the industry. Okay, great answers there. And as we're wrapping up, I wonder if you have had any final thoughts that you would leave the audience with about the company or just any other thoughts that you have for the rest of 2023? Um, I think it's an exciting time, actually, to be in copper exploration. I think um, we are starting, as an industry, we've been talking a lot about undercover exploration. And it's been utilized in some parts of um, the industry, but not, you know, broadly. Manduro really focuses on undercover exploration. It's something that we've been doing for 10 years. And I think right now, based on the amount of geophysical techniques, um, you know, the efficiency, it's, especially in Eastern Europe, it's so cost effective to do drilling. It actually is really exciting because you have a better opportunity in order to make a new discovery in these regions. Okay, well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming on to share about what's going on at the company and in the copper space. Thank you for inviting us. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with InvestingNews.com, and this is Tio Dechev with Mondoro Capital. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.